In this video, I am going to start discussing what are called spontaneous collapse theories, or oftentimes called objective collapse theories. And in this one, I will be focusing on what that means for a single particle. Future videos, I will talk about what that means for multiple particles, but we first need to talk about what that means for a single particle. So John Stuart Bell once said of the measurement problem, which is the thing that the spontaneous collapse theories are trying to fix, either the wave function as given by the Schrodinger equation is not everything or it is not right. And so by not everything that means it's incomplete and by not right means that it is the wrong theory. So Norrison says that pilot wave theory takes the former horn of the dilemma so that the wave function is not everything. And so what that means is that it is in fact completed by adding the particle. So it's saying that we have the wave function and the wave function is correct, but it's just not everything. So the pilot wave theory adds the particle to it to complete the theory. Spontaneous collapse theories, however, take the latter horn of the dilemma, which says that the Schrodinger equation is not right because in fact, collapses, which are not part of the Schrodinger equation, do in fact occur, and they do it spontaneously, as the name suggests. So Norrison, whose book I'm following for these videos, puts it this way. The spontaneous collapse theory is, at root, an attempt to remove this troubling dualism of the behavior of quantum systems while being measured and while not being measured, by positing for the wave function a single universally applicable dynamical evolution law which will somehow accomplish in a single stroke the two jobs done respectively by the Schrodinger equation and the collapse postulate of QM. So essentially he's saying here that it's trying to take the collapse postulate and come up with a theory for the collapse rather than just having it as this postulate. The idea, more specifically, is to modify Schrodinger's equation with stochastic nonlinear terms which will have the effect of preserving the Schrodinger evolution for microscopic systems, where we know it is correct, but also ensuring that macroscopic things like pointers and cats end up in these sorts of definite non-superposed states we observe them to always end up in. The first such theory to gain much traction was that of Giancarlo Girardi, Alberto Rimini, and Tullio Weber, also called the GRW theory, so that's what I'll be calling it through these videos. This theory proposes that there are spontaneous wave function collapses, or localizations, in position space. Using only position space works, Norrison says, because all quantum measurements read out in position space, like with our pointer model. The localization is rough in that the wave function localized to a finite Gaussian wave packet and not a delta function. Norson notes that this all may sound somewhat like a distinction without a difference in comparison to textbook quantum theory. We just now have random collapses rather than collapses during measurement processes. He points out that there are modifications of GRW theory, such as continuous spontaneous localization that appear more natural, coherent, and plausible, but that GRW theory supplies a good pedagogical tool. So in other words, the modifications are nice and probably necessary, but the main underlying ideas are present in GRW theory, so that's the one that we will primarily be talking about here. Further, Norrison points out that although GRW theory maintains the sort of dualism inherent in textbook quantum mechanics, so between the collapsed and non-collapsed systems. Spontaneous collapse theories at least have a theory of collapse as opposed to a postulate along with some ambiguous talk about mysterious measurements and observers. So what does the GRW theory actually say? So it says the wave function of a single particle evolves according to the linear deterministic Schrodinger equation, which is right here, most of the time, but that it is interrupted by nonlinear stochastic spontaneous localizations. These spontaneous localizations have a constant probability p per unit time, and we call that lambda here. We then get a Poisson distributed sequence of times with average waiting time between localizations of 1 over lambda here, and we call that time tau. GRW says that the constant lambda has a value of 10 to the negative 16 per second, and this can be read as 10 to the negative 16 localizations 
equalizations per second. And this gives us, if we do one over a lambda, of about 3 times 10 to the 8 years. So that's about 300 million years. So this is an average wait time between collapses for a single particle of 300 million years. As we'll see in later videos, when we have many particles, this actually occurs a lot more often. During the localization, what happens is that the wave function is essentially multiplied by a Gaussian function centered about the point x equal r, and this is our Gaussian right here. So we see this is a Gaussian wave function. It has this normalization factor in front, but then this exponential here is the Gaussian part of it. And we have this sigma here, which is the standard deviation for it. And so it is normalized so that the integral of the Gaussian equals 1. And the half width, which is kind of the standard deviation, is about 10 to the negative 7 meters, which is quite large compared to the size of an atom. So the smallest atom, the hydrogen atom, has a diameter of 1.06 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So this right here, this Gaussian, has a half width that is a thousand times larger than the size of a hydrogen atom. So our wave function prior to some time t naught here is evolving as the wave function, then it is reduced by the Gaussian. So we are multiplying by this Gaussian here, and we have this n of r here, which is a normalization. What that means is that the integral of all of this right here squared is going to be equal to 1. And so that's essentially the Born rule there, is saying that squaring it is kind of the probability of finding a particle. And so what we're doing here, so if we have this as our wave function, which is just this plane wave right here, we multiply it by this Gaussian right here, and when we do that, we end up with this. So we see that everywhere outside of that Gaussian here, the wave function has gone to zero, and now it is only supported here where that Gaussian was. And so that is essentially like the spontaneous collapse, where this wave right here, this plane wave multiplied by this, gives us this localization of that plane wave right here. But what is the value of r? In other words, at what point does the wave function actually get localized around? So this is random with a probability distribution given by the Born rule. So this p of r here is our probability probability of it showing up at some point r is equal to this right here, which is just our normalization factor squared. In other words, where the wave function squared is largest is where it is most likely to localize. So very similar to the Born rule. For example, if we have a very spread out wave function, such that it has length l that is much longer than the Gaussian, so that means our l is much greater than the sigma, this gives us right here as our wave function. The spontaneous localization is therefore most likely going to occur at a point r where the wave function has support. And so what we mean by that is that we have right here, this is our wave function. After the collapse, it shows up right here. And down here is our probability of finding the wave function. So there is equal probability that it would show up right here but also equal that it would have shown up right here. So it has an equal probability of showing up anywhere along this wave packet right here. Now, if instead of being very spread out, we have a wave function that is much smaller than sigma, where we can use the extreme case of a delta function for our wave function, we can normalize this in the following way. So we use this, and when the spontaneous localization occurs, the wave function is multiplied by the Gaussian at a random point r, where the probability distribution at this point is given by this. So it's essentially just the square of our Gaussian. A point r with a distance sigma on either side of x equals a is randomly chosen in the wave function after this looks like this. So we have this after the collapse, and we see that after doing this math, that it ends up being equal to where it was before the collapse, which just means that the spontaneous localization does not change the wave function, which makes sense since the delta function is already as localized as possible. So that looks like this. So this is the probability right here where the Gaussian would show up. And so what happens is after the collapse, we see that we have our wave function right here with the t plus is after the collapse. This was what it was before the collapse, and it's in exactly the same position there. Now, if we have two entangled particles that are a distance away from each other much greater than sigma, so we can think of our Einstein boxes 
thought experiment from the EPR paper, each with sharply defined delta function positions, we then get this, where we have these two delta functions right here. Each of them have a 50% chance of actually having the localization. So that means that there is a 50% chance the particle is located at plus A and a 50% chance the particle is located at negative A, where remember the magnitude of A is much greater than sigma. The probability for the spontaneous localization will then be two symmetric Gaussian functions. So that's this right here. So we have our two symmetric Gaussian functions here, so each one has a 50% chance of being the localization position. Where with A much greater than sigma, we get that this vanishes. So we have A up here in the numerator in our exponent, but it is a negative exponent. And so that means that this ends up going to essentially the inverse of infinity, if we want to think about it that way. And then so it vanishes. And so that means this term right here vanishes. And so we get this as our N. So the post-collapse wave function, so we have this, the T plus here is post-collapse. We go through the math for this, and we see that this ends up as a delta function at R equals plus A. So after throwing out a term that vanishes, what this shows is that if R equals plus A, then the delta function annihilates at X equals negative A, and the reverse would be true if R equaled negative A. So that's what we are showing up here. So we have these two symmetric Gaussians here that are our probability distributions. If we end up having it show up on the X equals A right here, we see that our T plus, we end up with a delta function centered there, and it vanishes at X equals negative A where at t negative here before, it was equally likely to be at both of those. But anyway, that was everything I wanted to talk about for the single particle. Before I get to the video about multiple particles, I am going to make a video where I actually talk about where these numbers come from. So the sigma equals 10 to the negative 7 meters, and this lambda equals 10 to the negative 16 per second. So I'm going to make a video about where those numbers actually come from, because they seem somewhat sort of handed down from on high, but there is a bit of justification for them, even though it's maybe a little bit arbitrary seeming. But anyway, I will talk about that in the next video. I hope you found this interesting, and I will see you in the next one.